This is the Human Action Podcast with your hosts, Jeff Deist and Dr. Bob Murphy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. Had a live show last week at Mises University, and this week we're back. My co-host, Dr. Bob Murphy. How you doing, Bob? Good to see you last week. Oh, great to see you guys down there as well. Glad to be back here in the saddle. So our topic today, in light of this brouhaha recently over the definition of a recession, is what happens when economists become overtly politicized? What happens when they injure their discipline, their field of study, in service of a particular political agenda? What happens when they become court economists, or we might even say regime economists? And Bob, this is, I think, increasingly common in your uh, field of study. Mm -hmm. And we start, as I guess we always must, with Mr. Paul Krugman, who has of late issued a bit of a mea culpa about being wrong about inflation a couple years ago in terms of his predictions, and also coming out quite strongly in, in favor of Joe Biden. So Paul Krugman, of course, our listeners would view him as a purely political animal, but perhaps the main, his mainstream uh, readership does not. Right. And so, yeah, we will focus on him and then move on to some other examples, because it would be kind of silly just to have a podcast just devoted to Paul Krugman. Who would do such a thing? Uh, week after week, talking <laughs> yeah, about no, Paul right, Krugman. Right. God, that sounds insane. Jeez, who would want to listen to that? Um, but yeah, he, he had this tweet. So you're right on the inflation stuff. Krugman, uh, he debated Larry Summers in the beginning of what, 2021 on saying, Hey, inflation is not going to be a big deal. And Summers was warning, Hey, you know, you people supporting the Biden stimulus package or whatever, be careful. Um, as of the summer of 2021, Krugman had a piece coming out saying when inflation at the time was under 5%, and by, and by which I mean the annual increase in CPI. Uh, and he was saying, hey, remember when people were worried about inflation? Ha ha, that's so last month, you know, because he was mm. sure it had peaked at that point. So finally, yes, Krugman now has come out in 2022 at various points admitting I was wrong. He just had a column run a few weeks ago that the title they gave it was I was wrong about inflation. But even there, again, he's doing PR damage control, saying things like, no, this isn't an ideological dispute. There was all Keynesians who were in the room on this, and we just disagreed empirically about the magnitudes. And so he's trying to distinguish it from, hey, remember back when a bunch of right wingers in 2010 were arguing that QE was going to cause inflation. And then when it didn't blow up gas prices, we were all saying they were a bunch of frauds and needed to resign. So now Krugman has to explain why that's not true for him. And so mm -hmm. he's saying this isn't ideological. It was all Keynesians disagreeing. So that stuff's funny. But the thing that you know, caught my eye, Jeff, for this week's topic was Krugman recently tweeted out saying, since I get lots of mockery for having talked about a Biden boom, which he did, you know, he had this thing called the coming Biden boom and was talking early on in the administration about that. I thought I'd share a chart. He shows a chart showing jobs added cumulatively under Trump and Biden. And of course, more jobs are added under Biden than Trump because Biden inherited an economy after COVID that was way down. So just that going back to normal, of course, was a huge increase in the number of jobs. And then Krugman says, the problem may be that the Biden economy boomed too much, feeding inflation, and that it now needs to cool off, which may involve a recession, but hasn't yet. So the reason, I mean, so one thing is that's kind of just funny, like, oh, a good way to explain it. Like, yeah, the, the problem was uh, Biden's economy was too good. That That's why we're mm. having trouble now is because it was so awesome when he first came in that the awesomeness now flipped. But beyond that kind of silliness is the fact that Earlier, when Krugman was mocking the Austrian theory of the business cycle, he was saying that sort of thing is impossible. And, and specifically, he, he mocked what he called the hangover theory. And when I say mocked, I mean that literally. That he was saying, I regard this as about as worthy of attention as the phlogiston theory of fire, you know, referring to sort of medieval, uh, archaic explanations before modern science. And, and he was saying things like, hey, there, arithmetic is arithmetic. If there's more spending and investment, then there has to be less in consumption, or if there's more spending and consumption. Less. And so he was saying, how could it possibly be? The Austrian story doesn't even make sense in terms of arithmetic. And he had a nice quote saying, nobody has, let me just make sure I get it right. Uh, the hangover theory then turns out to be intellectually incoherent. Nobody has managed to explain why bad investments in the past require the unemployment of good workers in the present. But yet he says, emotionally, we like to have these stories of, past you know sins leading to current penance and punishment because it just makes us feel good and it sort of justifies the right-wingers desire to have workers suffer 
So that's what he says when he's talking about the Austrian theory. And yet now he does allow for it. Just two other quick examples under Trump. Krugman often referred to the fact that, oh, yeah, early on, Trump had a sugar high economy. So, again, this this notion that you can get a, sh- a short term surge in the numbers, but you pay the price down the road. I mean, that's what a sugar high is. No doctor says go take a bunch of sugar and that's going to provide long lasting improvement in your physical condition. It means you're doing something now at the expense of the future. And then Alex Tabarak had a thing during the George W. Bush years where he said Krugman has a hangover and linked, ironically enough, to Brad DeLong who I won't go through the quotes now, but was pointing out Krugman was in, as of 2005 was saying how the feds running out of bubbles. We may be paying the price for our past excesses. So he was using all the language then under Republican administrations that he had earlier critiqued in saying the Austrian theory, you know, that doesn't make sense even in terms of basic arithmetic. So Krugman is a crypto Austrian when there's a Republican in office, and then it, when it's the Republicans' excesses that need to explain, you know, the, the future. And in Biden's case, it's just, again, there's too much awesomeness when he first came in, and that's why we now might have to have a recession, because the boom was too high. Yeah, isn't that interesting? They do sound like Austrians all of a sudden, the fact that there was an artificial economy under Trump, and that it can't last, and there'll be a recession to pay for it. Um, yeah. It, it, let me just, I just are, mentioned, I'm sorry to cut, but I just want to make sure people, I'm not putting words, Brad DeLong, who people don't mm-hmm. know, is buddies with Krugman and is, is a Keynesian. Back in 2005, he titled it, Paul Krugman gets in touch with his inner Friedrich Hayek. So DeLong was noting, hey, Paul, what you're talking now about the Fed and the, and the asset bubbles under these, you know, deregulated Republican administration, it, it you sound like an Austrian. So... <laughs> Well, just imagine if we had the current economic conditions with respect to price inflation, with respect to you know gas prices, shortages, lingering shortages, which I don't think can any longer simply be attributed to COVID lockdowns, and Trump were still president. Does anyone on earth think that Paul Krugman would be saying the same things he is now? I mean, he is insanely a partisan. Right, exactly. Yeah, he first of all, he wouldn't have been just saying, oh, there was a big boom. And now, you know, that that changed expectation. He would have called it a sugar high like he actually did under Trump because there was. And then, yeah, you're you're totally right. He would be focusing on that. I found a thing too, going back to this issue about the definition of recession. Now, you know, Krugman's coming out and was warning people ahead of those numbers. Hey, two quarters of negative growth does not mean a recession. He was real adamant about that. But yet, under in the Bush year, it was 2008 and early in the way the numbers first came out in the first quarter of 2008, there was a positive growth. And Krugman was quick to explain to his readers, hey, hey, just because there's a positive, number, don't worry. You know, I don't care what the official definition of recession is. What worries what matters is that people are hurting right now. So <laughs> so it's not now. You know, now he didn't say who cares what the definition is. Let's ask our people hurting right now which may have raised some interesting quite now it was just no this is what the definition is we talking about so yes it, it's clear in his case he's probably the best example of someone who's completely partisan a different example too is when trump won crewman's column came it was like the second or third column afterward and it said deficits matter again like that was literally <laughs> so it was just funny how the nature of deficits because he was of course all during obama years saying don't listen to these hawks. They're crazy. They've been so wrong for 10 years in a row. And then all of a sudden Trump comes in and then he says, oh, now deficits do matter. It was it was interesting how everything just lined up right in the change of administrations. Bobber, is it correct to say that shrinking nominal GDP numbers over a, a couple of quarters are actually worse than they appear because inflation is such, that especially governments at both the federal, state and local levels are spending more? And, and that increased spending goes into GDP. In other words, they're, they're paying more for things due to inflation and spending more on stimulus and other things. So is it, so when, when we say GDP is shrinking or growing less slow, more slowly, inflation actually makes that worse, right? Because we're talking about nominal GDP, not adjusted GDP, especially when we're looking at just, you know, year over year in the past 24 months. Okay, so... Let me try to unpack that. When they say two quarters of falling G- GDP means a recession, or at least is the rule of thumb, and that's what they're arguing about, that, that means real. So they are adjusting. So it, it, I think r- the nominal GDP figures might be higher now than they were like two quarters ago, I, I think, or they're, they're close. So, so they, they're, they, they mean they're adjusting for prices, but you're right that uh, if the economy is falling into a recession, 
and then there's the so-called automatic stabilizers that tends to make governments spend more. And so from an Austrian perspective, since government spending per se is, if anything, bad, you know, you're mm-hmm. taking resources mm-hmm. away from the private sector and having p- the political mechanism allocate them, then right. that, But yet that gets counted dollar for dollar as part of GDP. Yes, I, I think that that means the numbers are worse or sorry, that the situation is worse than the official numbers would suggest as you go into a recession. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. Well, if you recall, Thomas Piketty put out put out his famous book, Capital in the 21st Century. That's got to be 10 years ago now or so. And yeah. this was a wholly politicized book. I mean, he was openly progressive, openly socialist in his ambitions. He caught a lot of flack for the book. He got a lot of support for the book on both sides. But this struck me as an outsider, as an observer somewhat, as a turning point a little bit for economics. In other words, taking the science, what's supposed to be a discipline, an academic field, and turning it just openly towards particular political positions. Am I right, or do you think that economics has always been this political and I just didn't realize it? Yeah, I, I think you're definitely right. So for sure, to me, economics seems more politicized than it used to be. So yeah, I think the inequality debate among professional economists and the minimum wage debate are the two areas where it really is. And and I don't just mean like, oh yeah, it's the other side. They there's a set like you see it on the right too that um, for, for the for the minimum wage, just to be more specific on that one, it so it used to be like as of the early 1980s, it, there was a consensus among you know right wing conservative economists, left wing liberal economists, because back then they tended to come as liberal, not progressive. And mm-hmm. that, yeah, raising the minimum wage, especially aggressively, was not a good idea that would end up hurting, you know, low skilled teenage workers, which is ostensibly the people you're trying to help. Like that was that was a consensus. So the you know the, the left leaning economists thought you should do other things like earned income tax credit or whatever. They didn't just say, hey, okay. throw up your hands and let laissez faire rule. But they were saying, no, that particular instrument is a blunt one. And, you know, that may end up doing more harm than good. Um, and then that that consensus collapsed. You know, there's a famous Card Kruger study, and, and then just over time. And so my point though is, what's weird? It, it would be one thing to say economists disagree about whether raising the minimum wage hurts or helps. But what's weird is if you ask economists, what does the literature say empirically? You know what I'm saying? Like then mm-hmm. even there they'll disagree. That people on the right will tend to say, no, no, no most of the the literature properly construed still says that old consensus is upheld. Whereas the left leaning kind of say, no, there's no evidence anymore. That was an old, that's been discredited. And so what, what's going on is the studies that still show the minimum wage hurts aren't doing the particular adjustments that the progressives think ought to be done with the data. And so they don't count those. They say those aren't well-crafted studies. All the good studies coming out support. We, and that, so that's the trick they're doing. But I'm just saying from the general public's point of view, you can't even ask a simple question like, what does the literature say? You won't get a straight answer. And so... It's, you know, it, it, the divide goes that far. And then, yeah, as far as the inequality stuff, for people who don't know, Piketty's book, it was it was shocking. Like, for, just to give an example, the thing I noticed when I was flipping through it and when I first got it, the, the history of the minimum wage in the United States was just wrong. He had it that the minimum wage was always hiked under Democrats and never under Republicans, starting like from, I, I want to say like Eisenhower forward or something like that. And it was he was just wrong. Like, it was, no, that's not true. Like, it was hiked under George W. Bush or whatever. And I was even looking at his date, like, to try to figure out, is it because he's in France and he doesn't understand our fiscal years or so? I was trying to figure it out. And there was, I could explain, like, a couple of his misses, but the rest was like, no, it's just he needs the narrative to be that. And, uh, and then I had a co-author on a paper where we critiqued it, and Phil Magnus went in. And for his data sets, like to just go historically and say, here's what happened in these countries and look at how the inequality, like he's trying to show the story of governments reduce their tax rates. All of a sudden, the rich got as bad as it was during the Gilded Age, blah, blah, blah. And some of the data sets, like Piketty's just making stuff up and plugging numbers in. And you wouldn't know that from reading his, you know, you see these nice charts and it looks like that's historical fact when a lot of those points he just made up. So, uh, so yeah, that, that was, and then to see, the economists defending Piketty, the left-leaning ones, that was really where I agree with you, Jeff. It was kind of like how journalism really collapsed under the Trump years. So yes, of course, CNN was biased before, but it wasn't so naked. Yeah, with with Piketty and the way the right-wingers would come out and point out demonstrable mistakes, 
and the left wingers were just throwing it, you know, excusing it. It was it was shocking. But isn't it the job of economists to say his good intentions are not enough and that this has to be scientifically rigorous? You would think so. Uh, and I, a lot of this stuff, too, it, it's partly because that I think the reason this persists is because economics is they want it to they, they, they act as if it's like chemistry or physics when it's actually not. You don't have controlled experiments. And so with a lot of this, like the minimum wage stuff. It's not that the one side is lying and the other side's telling the truth. It's you can do whatever adjustments to the data you want. Like you can add in more stuff in the regression and hold things equal. Like to, to give an example, so certain states that did not have their own minimum wage legislation unquestionably have higher rates of growth and employment for teenage workers. Nobody disputes that. But then they want to come in and say, oh, well, that's just for other reasons. It's not because of the minimum wage. And one of the reasons they give is, oh, the states that had that did have minimum wage hikes, they had more automation over the years. But if you think about it, well, right. So if, if you're like McDonald's and you know they're going to raise the minimum wage, you're going to start bringing in, you know, the drink machines, you just press the button and it fills it. You know I mean? You're going to transition so that you can just have a few 20-year-olds running the shift rather than, you know, one 30-year-old and a bunch of 17-year-olds or something, which maybe they would have done, you know, if labor costs were lower. So the idea that, oh, no, this the lower employment of teenage workers in states that have a high minimum wage isn't due to the minimum wage. It's due to the fact that the fast food restaurants all have more automation. That doesn't solve the problem, yet, but they're doing stuff like that. So they're not making up numbers the way Piketty was, but mm -hmm. the tricks they're doing, if you even, you know, have the basic one econ 101 familiarity, you would know, well, no, you're just sweeping the problem away. That's the very type of thing we're worried about. Well, Michael Tanner over at Cato had an interesting article about Piketty's book a while back. It's called Piketty Gets It Wrong. And he points out that uh, apart from all the errors in research and data which Piketty presents, you know, the general idea in the book, which is that capital has returned more than labor, especially in emerging societies like China, Tanner says, well, that may well be true, but the answer to that is to have more people own capital. And mm -hmm. all the things that uh, make it possible for more people to own capital, like letting them have individual accounts with their half of the Social Security taxes or something like that, you know, the left strongly opposes. Uh, getting rid of capital gains taxes on people below a certain income so that they can start to have a small business or own some stock or own a house for the first time, people in less affluent parts of the country. So I thought that was an interesting point by Tanner. But, but here's the thing, Bob, when we're talking about this, whether it's Cato or the Mises Institute or Bob Murphy or Michael Tanner, there are an awful lot of people who view economics as a phony, made-up profession, mm -hmm. which just exists to provide some sort of intellectual cover for business interests, for capital, and right. to defend and excuse capital. Um, and that it's not real, that economics can simply be commanded by legislative fiat. And if governments want to raise minimum wage, then legislatures can just do it by God. And that what all you sort of right-wingy libertarian people at the Mises Institute, you know, you're just another version of the Piketty's of the world. You're mm -hmm. grinding an ideological axe and using a profession to provide a veneer for it. I mean, you understand this. Oh, yeah, I totally understand. I'm sympathetic to it because, like you say, we, we, we talked about this in a previous episode, Jeff, where I, I mentioned this story. I'll just repeat it real fast for those who missed it, was I was at a, uh, you know, a social dinner and the uh it, it somehow you know somebody asked me what i did for a living and i said i kind of oh and then of course the next question what do you think about it's going to happen next year and at, at the time i think it was i don't even remember i think it was during the george w bush years i'm not I'm forgetting the date but i said whatever i said and then the guy was like well see i don't agree with that because duh, 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 duh. and it struck me you know i didn't complain but it, you know it was kind of myth because it struck me that if i had been a brain surgeon and talked a little bit about my work the guy would not have just confidently told me well i disagree with that they would have, but then on the other hand, I was more sympathetic because I could see, yeah, economists really don't, you know, don't deserve the trust from the public the way experts in certain other fields do, um, for precisely the reasons we're talking about, you know, in this in this episode, Jeff. So, uh, I I understand why they would think that. Just to give an example, so Robert Reich on Twitter recently sent out a thing saying, oh, the minimum wage, you know, hasn't been raised since blah, blah, blah. Like in real terms, the minimum wage is, you know, in 1960, if you look at that number versus now, it's way lower, even though, you know, worker productivity has gone up to I'm making these up like $50 an hour or something like that. 
And so I wrote and, and I said, are you saying that right now there's workers getting paid the minimum wage who are actually generating $50 an hour of output for their employer? Mm-hmm. And if so, don't you like, don't you have some connections with employers to can't you just explain this to them? They just hire, you know what I mean? Like you don't need to wait for the federal government to raise the minimum wage. There's a huge profit opportunity. And in the comments, of course, people were just blasting me like you, Oh, you head in the sand. You think workers get paid their marginal product. And so, mm-hmm. yes, they, I understand that mentality of we seem like we're, uh, you know, in our ivory tower, we have these theory. You don't understand how it is for the, you know, the, the actual blue collar workers. Cause you're getting, you know, you got your tenured position and blah, blah, blah. So I, I understand that mentality and I would be suspicious too. It's just, I do think, think that, you know, I could flip it and say, wait a minute, you, you trust the politicians. You think these senators actually are concerned about you and how you're struggling to make ends meet. You really think that's what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is interesting. If people are producing $50 an hour and they're being paid 10, you'd think somebody might come along and pay them 12 or 15 or 20 or even 40. Right. Uh, But apparently uh, not according to Robert Reich, you know, they talk a lot about uh, diversity in economics, it's too male, it's too white, it's too conservative. That's another shibboleth, that basically economists are all right-wingers. And that was somewhat true relative to, let's say, the sociology department or the English department at most universities. I've talked at length to Joe Salerno about this. He says it's not at all like how it used to be, that you know they were mostly Republicans or mostly fairly free market, but that's changed. But I mean, here's a nice vignette. When it comes to real diversity, ideological or viewpoint diversity, if you recall, Bob, a couple of years ago when Trump nominated poor Judy Shelton to mm-hmm. the Fed board, I mean, my gosh. Now, she's a person who in the past had said some good things about gold. She had questioned the moral hazard created by FDIC insurance, which I think is a wonderful thing to question. Um, and she had basically questioned the Fed's rate setting program and said, you know, that sounds sort of central planning-ish. And, you know, she was no Austrian. I think I actually wrote an article about that. Judy Shelton is no Austrian, but Mm -hmm. da-da-da. She's more of a Larry Kudlow, King Dollar. Maybe you could call her a supply sider. But nonetheless, the mere nomination of her elicited these howls of protest from the economics profession. There was a big letter, a famous letter that 100 economists signed, including seven Nobels, including Stiglitz, Mm -hmm. for example, there was a big letter, a similar letter signed by a bunch of ex-Fed officials, and they basically said, well, you know, we want diversity at the Fed, but her ideas are so outside of the mainstream, this is just absolutely terrible. And it struck me as uh, pretty telling on the profession. Yeah, that was my, I think I wrote something for Mises too. Maybe we can dig, dig up both of our pieces and put in the show notes for this episode because, yeah, it was, her views were pretty not, because they had even people on the right also were going after her too. And that's what was really interesting is because, Oh yeah, these whack. And there's this weird tendency for people on the right to want to be respectable. And so when somebody who has kind of radical views and and her views weren't Mm -hmm. even, she was just defending the classical gold standard. You know, she wasn't saying, Hey, just let's get rid of government involvement money altogether and just have it to be total free market, you know, and whatever happens, happens. Like she wasn't even saying that she was just saying, let's link the dollar to gold the way it had been you know, before FDR. Um, and, and, and yeah, even people on the right were just, these views are just so far, you know, we were for respectable free market views, but this is beyond that. And they were digging up like Milton Friedman one time went after her for something. And I think I was defending her in that exchange to show that Friedman had misunderstood what she was saying. Like she was talking about linking the dollar to gold at a fixed rate. And then that implies that there's, you know, fixed exchange rates. Like if the, you know, that the Frank and the dollar are both tied to gold, then there's a fixed dollar Frank exchange rate. And Friedman was denouncing that as price controls, like a la, you know, minimum wage or something. And it's 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 a qualitatively different thing if you're linking your own currency to gold. But anyway, yes, the the right was going after her too. And again, I think it was maybe it was partly like a territorial thing also because I think mm-hmm. she's not in their little club. She was kind of on no. outside a no. lot of the, the, those networks, and so for her to come in, why is Trump picking her? You know, our guys have been doing the fighting the good fight and doing policy white papers, you know, in Washington for 20 years. And she's out doing private consulting and now she's going to come in and get on the Fed. Are you kidding me? So I think there was some of that going on, too. Well, let's face it. The last 20 or 30 years of monetary policy across the West has been an unmitigated disaster. It's caused huge bubbles, huge recessions, you know, all these ups and downs that central banks were supposed to smooth out. Yeah. How's that been for Greece? Uh, for example. I mean, this is just the absolute death of technocratic expertise 
as an institution in society that needs to be respected. I mean, it's just absolute nonsense. And I think part of the reason Judy Shelton was so hated and attacked is she has a, a business degree from the University of Utah, for God's mm-hmm. sake. You know, heaven forbid we don't have Wharton and Stanford and Yale running everything at the Fed. I mean, it, you talk about diversity. The, these, these elites have failed us. They've certainly failed us in monetary policy. And so uh, I do think that was part of it. But there's also it, it, this you, idea. I'm sorry, sorry go ahead. Just Bob. real quick, Jeff. Yeah, you and what you just hit on too, that I think that's another reason I understand why the people on the left don't trust these like people espousing free market views because it's not just Austria, you know, it's not just people in the Mises Institute talking about like hardcore, hey, do we, can we privatize nuclear weapons? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. It's like the IMF or whatever. It is true when they come in and like give a, a loan bailout, blah, blah, blah package to some, you know, country, tiny country in South America that's in trouble. They have all kinds of conditions like, OK, now you're going to have respect for property, right? You're not going to expropriate mm-hmm. these foreign investors, right? OK, and let's let's get rid of some of these, you know, currency controls you have and let's reduce your capital gains. So they, you know, th- this is what people refer to like as neoliberalism or whatever. They they don't like it and they, they associate that with like, again, you know, the IMF or the World Bank, even though from our point of view, that's the furthest thing from a genuine you know free market reforms. But you can see why really actively interventionist leftists think that. And they think this is all, like you say, there's no, there's no science here. This is just your politics. And the reason Larry Kudlow thinks what he thinks is because of political reasons and the reason, you know, so that's since they don't think anybody actually knows, there's no fact of the matter. It's not like there really are underlying laws. Then yeah, if it's all just a power struggle, the workers should get paid more and it just reduces the profits of the capitalist. It's not like, there's going to be unintended consequences because you're treating this like it's physics and it's not. This is just politics. That's what they think. Well, when things become politicized, though, what happens to the discipline itself? For example, what happens to the standards of treatment of professional courtesy among academics? I'm sure you remember a few years ago, there was a big brouhaha when Nancy McLean wrote her mm-hmm. book, Democracy in Chains, which, among other things, attacked James Buchanan in the Public Choice School. He had been at, at UVA, I believe, and George Mason. Um, and she didn't just attack his work. I mean, she said that he was you know, someone who wanted to enslave democracy. She impugned his motives. Uh, and this is more and more common today. When you were getting your PhD at NYU, did you guys have any classes on ethics or uh, professional standards within economics and how you treat your presumed colleagues? We, no, that never came up, but I think it was partly because that was my, my program. It wasn't too ideological. Like, so everybody involved, except for like me and maybe one other student was, they were definitely like left-leaning progressive interventionists and they were just okay. going to NYU. A lot of them were foreign. So my, in my program, a lot, it was it was like the UN. There were a lot of different representatives from different countries. And a lot of them were being sent and funded by their governments to go get trained to come back and run their central banks or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, wow. it's like, oh, you got to go to the West to learn how to run an economy. And then you come back here and do it. So that's where they were. So it was, it's that stuff didn't come up so much just because, like I said, everybody was on the same page. Like they were so ensconced in, in their mm-hmm. in their worldview over there that that wouldn't, you know, in terms of a debate. Yeah, like I think... I think a lot of them would have said, if you said like, hey, what, what about Krugman? They would have said, oh, yeah, in his popular stuff, he does, he is kind of a, you know, brawler and, you know, we take it or leave it. But, you know, in his published stuff, he won the Nobel for and whatever. He's he's solid. I think that's the way they would have handled it. So, um, but you're right. As time has gone on now, because there's less, because they come up with more tricks to be able to get the numbers to do whatever you want. Now it does it is it does fall more on ideological lines. In other words, the people who don't want there to be a hike in the capital gains tax or who don't want a hike in the minimum wage, they can come up with a model and support it with the data to show, see, my policy is right and the left can do the mirror image. And so I think that partly does explain why there's such rancor, because now it's not really like, oh, yeah, you honestly arrived at that conclusion. Just, you you chose those assumptions to get the result you wanted. And, the, you know, that's largely correct. So. When you're doing it, you think, no, these are the right assumptions to make because that sounds plausible, but because it gives you the answer you want. Whereas if it showed raising the minimum wage doesn't have an impact, you would go and look at the assumptions and say, well, that can't be right. Let me go see what's, what we did wrong here. You know, So that's kind of what happens. But certainly, yeah, to answer your question, it's I, I have noticed that the, 
the res- professional courtesy and respect is much lower now. And part of it might just be because now more economists are online arguing and they're, you know, to, to get a bigger reaction, you say something provocative. You don't just say, oh, my P value is this on this regression. Like nobody cares about that. You want to say this guy, you know, is, is a stooge working for big oil. Mm-hmm. Well, and of course, society in general is far more politicized today. Mm-hmm. And we would certainly expect that a, a vital professional discipline like economics wouldn't be immune to that. I mean, that that's obvious. But nonetheless, what does it mean for the profession when you've got all these economists basically treating one another like propagandists and pouncing on their literature or their research the minute it comes out with it using an ideological lens, even if they don't admit that? I mean, that sounds to me like a, a bad profession. That's not helping us. Right. Yeah. Just to give a quick example, this literally happened, I think, two days ago, is uh, I follow this guy. His last name's Dubay, D-U-B-E. His first name's difficult to pronounce, so I won't try. Um, and he he's one of the leading minimum wage revisionists, right? So he's a labor economist, and he's one of the leading guys whose models you know, helped overturn the old consensus to show, no, with the latest econometric techniques, we can see, you know, at least modest hikes in the minimum wage, they don't have any impact. Don't listen to those right-wing fear mongers. They're just lying to you. They just want to protect, you know, fast food profits. You know, they big fry uh, is, mm-hmm. is they're in the service of them. And so these sort of right-wing economists came out with a paper that showed, you know, they had plausible models and blah, 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 blah. And in the paper, they were trying to show how can it be that apparently, empirically, hikes in the minimum wage in the short run don't seem to do too much. But yet we know in the long run they do have impacts and like it just consistent with the rest of literature, like how could people not respond to incentives? So they come up with a model where it's, you know, businesses make capital investments and then it's it takes time to transform them. So once you're locked into a certain business structure, you kind of have to hire a certain number of workers to work with the machinery you've set up. But in the long run, you adjust. And so if workers get a lot more expensive, then you move to more capital intensive. Like, you know, so it's a plot that sounds like the real world. Yeah, it's true. McDonald's just can't totally revamp its floor in a year. But if they knew, oh, yeah, five years from now, the minimum wage is going to get doubled, then they could start mm-hmm. planning accordingly. And so in their model, they do that. And in the long and short of it, with their calibrated results, it was that after four years, 25% of the adjustment had taken place. And after it, and, and so there was workers did benefit in the short run because businesses like couldn't move away from them fast enough. But then in the long run, workers end up getting hurt by it. And then the study said, you know, we think after by the first decade, that's the point at which new workers entering the force are hurt by the prior, you know, minimum wage hike, you know, in terms of their lifetime earnings. And the way this guy Dubai summarized that was he said, Oh, look at this. The the latest paper to come out to a, you know, critique the minimum wage. They argue that, it's not even worth looking at the policies because it takes decades. And he said, yes, you read that right decades for us to even see any impact. And no, that's like, that's not a good summary of what I just said. (laughs) They said after four years, you see 25% of the adjustment. And after one decade, the the effect is gone and now workers are being hurt. But someone who read his thing would, would take away. So that, that's kind of what I mean is it's, you can't trust anybody. And I knew that going into it. I knew when he said that, I said, I bet you that's not right. Let me go look at their paper. So that's the thing is, you know, not at this point. And, and people on the right, I'm sure, do that to people on the left as well, that it's just I'm more attuned to, you know, the other way around. But, yeah, so th- there's stuff like that all the time where critics will say some. And, and you mentioned the inequality debate. It was, it was there all the time. They would present these results. You would just look at it and say, that can't be right. And then you'd go dig into theirs and you'd see, oh, this is the trick they use to give that. And no, actually, they've misrepresented what they did to the public. The public would not understand, you know, what they said to the public would mislead them. They would think something else was going on than what's really going on. Well, when it comes to impugning motives, I'll just say, if you look at the worker shortage, especially at lower paid type jobs, I think there's actually a concerted effort to get rid of these jobs, to have people stay at home, to create a class of voters who are dependent on UBI or something equivalent mm-hmm. to that, just like there's a class of voters now who are dependent on disability or Social Security. I mean, the Walmart by my house has gotten rid of all but one or two cashiers. Yep. It's yep. all these, you know, these huge fields of self-checkout. And there's sort of one person watching that, I guess, to try to make sure you're not stealing anything. And the convenience store by my house, it has a mini rush hour in the mornings around six or so, because there's a lot of painters and workers going different places. 
a lot of people getting gas, a lot of people getting their coffee, their monster energy drinks. And so they kind of need two cashiers because if you're trying to run in and out of the convenience store, you don't want to be in there too long. You're just on your way to work or whatever. But now they have one cashier and they have this new device. It's a pad of mm-hmm. sorts. And you just put all your stuff on it and it somehow reads them all and rings it up. And you can use cash or card. The machine even gives you change. So when you look at this sort of thing, I, I mean, certainly our progressive friends know that's coming. And they have to know on some level that that's what's going to happen if you pay people not to do, you know, less glamorous, less fun jobs like working at a convenience store. Uh, but it, I, I wonder, Bob, it, are there examples on the right, maybe not Austro-libertarian, but on the right, are there court economists on the right as well who tend to promote anything that happens during Republican administration and excuse it? And attack the same thing if it happens under a Democratic administration. Oh, yeah, definitely. Is Just to be far I want to second everything you just said there. I've noticed it too. My Walmart, they're totally transitioning. It's it's now the case where like you're inconveniencing them if you want to check yourself out. And there's a huge line there. So you got to do the you know mental arithmetic. Like, okay, well, how, you, you look at the carts and how much stuff do these people in the, <laughs> in the one cashier line have in their cart? Oh, this lady, I can't believe she... So they're definitely moving towards that. I've also too. I've not like my bank um, closed the ATMs in one place, and then there, there, in my town there was only one other ATM, and I went there, and they it ran out of money. And, you know, a bunch of us were standing in line, and we're like, "Are you able to get money?" And and so yeah, I, they're they're definitely pushing people towards a cashless society, and you know, and you can say it's efficiency, and it would have happened anyway. But I don't trust <laughs> the people, you know, kind of behind the scenes, and it's it's going to be a lot easier to exercise centralized control, like you say, when Everyone's working from home through the internet, and you know most of the other things well, now are decent or centralized. Certainly, COVID accelerated it. Yes, for sure. So, to answer your your original question, that yeah, uh, and I was we didn't folks want this to come off as just us complaining about left leaning economists. It does happen. I, an example that comes to mind is, and I don't know the guy very well. You know, I don't know him personally, and whatever. So, you know, this some might say, oh, you got to look at his broader career, but. Like Kevin Hassett, I just remember under the uh, it was it was in 2010. Let me see if I can pull it because I wrote about it for Mises.org at the time. And it, you know, let me just make sure. Yeah, it was. I think it was 2010. But a, a a big number came out where GDP had grown that quarter by five. Real GDP 5.7 percent, which was you know that's a good number, right? And mm-hmm. uh, and Kevin Hassett had a Bloomberg article where he said, uh, you know. Um, he says, when is quarterly domestic product growth of almost 6% bad news when it looks like what was reported last week? And then he goes through to explain how, yeah, it was 5.7%, but 3.4 percentage points of that were because of an inventory bounce. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and so he was just going through and explaining all that. And so he was just trying to say, like, yeah, the economy produced 5.7% more stuff last quarter than the previous one at an annualized rate. But, you know, a lot of it was just businesses bulking up their inventory. So who cares? And actually, when you uh-huh. when I get into the numbers, it, it was more of like a, it was a weird. It was like the fall of inventories was lower than it had been, right? It, it wasn't the other. It was like a so weird it was, it was a or, tortured interpretation to to attack Obama. Yeah, right. And so I'm just and and now you see the opposite where pro Biden economists because of the, are saying, oh, the second quarter, you know, 2022 GDP numbers that are showed negative growth. That doesn't mean what you think it means, because what really happened is inventory surged in the fourth quarter of 2021, where I think GDP was like 6.7 percent growth. And so really, it's just, you know, we're drawing down those inventory. So, again, you can use that inventory adjustment to do whatever you want. If it's a big number and you don't like the the administration, which, you know, Hassett was doing under Obama, then you can argue don't the rosy number. It's misleadingly optimistic. It's just inventory change. And then, like I said, I'm seeing the flip side here where pro-Biden economists are saying, oh, yeah, that bad, ostensibly bad number, don't pay attention to it. It's just inventory adjustment. So, again, without, and they're not lying. With all this mm-hmm. stuff, you can do, you know, that's what I'm saying. With the, There's all these, it's just whatever, what do you want to focus on? Because with economics, there's 19 different things going on at any moment. And you can just hold some constant and let the other ones have free reign. And you can get whatever answer you want. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's it for the show, ladies and gentlemen. You, you know, it, economics appears to be just another institution which you can't trust. You always have to verify 
You have to read this stuff and realize that there's an ideological axe being ground in many, many cases. So we will link to a couple things. First of all, to Michael Tanner's interesting article over at Cato on Thomas Piketty. We'll link to Bob's article about Judy Shelton back when she was first appointed. And uh, we'll also link to my article on Nancy McLean's attack on uh, Buchanan and the George Mason folks. So all that being said, I want to thank you for joining us. Great to see you again, Bob, and have a great weekend. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. And in the meantime, you can find more content like this at Mises.org.